This week on the CNET Tech Review, hop inside an electric Rolls Royce at the Geneva Auto Show. Lovable lizards get animated in ILM's new Rango. Two sets of speakers that you're better off without. Oh, and some stuff about a new iPad or something like that. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's get started with the good. This week in San Francisco, Steve Jobs, oh, who am I kidding? You're just here to see the iPad too. Here's Donald Bell's first look. Hey, I'm Donald Bell for CNET.com. We're here at Apple's iPad 2 launch event, and I'm holding the iPad 2. In fact, I'm holding the white version of the iPad 2. There's now two colors, a white version and a black version. All the same prices, all the same capacities as last year's, uh, but you're now getting a much thinner design, a lighter design, and also getting a faster processor. There's a, there's a dual-core A5 processor in here. It's promising nine times the graphics performance of the original iPad. You're also getting a few new features. You're getting a FaceTime feature for video calling. You get uh, HD cameras on the back and a VGA camera on the front. Apple is also announcing two new applications for the iPad, their own applications. One's iMovie for the iPad, which was available before on the iPhone and the iPod Touch. It's now coming to the iPad. It's the most sophisticated version, well, at least the most sophisticated mobile version of iMovie we've seen yet. The other application that Apple announced today for the iPad is GarageBand. Uh, this is going to be a pretty cool application out there for you musical types. It does multi-track recording, virtual instruments, a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to see this thing March 11th. So having played around with the iPad 2, the little bit that I've had it here, I have to say the thing I like about it the most is how thin and light Apple's been able to get the design. Having seen a lot of their competitors this past year, I haven't seen anything that's gotten this small. And I think being able to preserve that 10-hour battery life is a big deal. It's going to be hard to be able to keep up with that. So for CNET.com, I'm Donald Bell, showing off the Apple iPad 2. I think everyone was a bit surprised to see Steve Jobs take the stage for the iPad 2 announcements, but he did turn the spotlight over to some other members of the Apple team to demo some of the tablet's key apps. Take a look at FaceTime, iMovie, and GarageBand, all optimized for iPad 2. FaceTime is the best and easiest way to video conference. We support it on the iPhone and we support it on the iPod Touch and now we're bringing it to the iPad. You can FaceTime between two iPads, between an iPad and an iPhone or an iPod Touch, and between an iPad and a Mac. Let me go ahead and just give you a demo. So it's calling uh, him and in a second he'll answer. How are you doing? Doing great, Scott. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. I was just giving everyone here a demo of FaceTime. You can see already that the size of the iPad is just ideal for video conferencing. I mean, the person's face is a great size. You can see all their expressions. It feels very personal. Uh, you can also use both the front camera and the rear camera. So, Michael, why don't you flip to the rear camera and show us what you're looking at? Sure thing, Scott. Okay, Michael's been locked in a, a very sad cafe. Uh, <laughs> you can also move the, the pip around to get it out of the way, so it's sort of pong, you can move it wherever you want. Uh, and, but FaceTime on this really is a great experience, and we can't wait for people to get their hands on it. And of course, from day one, you can FaceTime from your iPad 2 with all the iPhone 4 customers out there. Thanks a lot, Michael. So there's two apps we're introducing today and the first one is iMovie for iPad. Uh, and we have a long history of video editing. Uh, we, we're the largest supplier of video editing software in the world, we think. And uh, iMovie for iPad is in that tradition. It's got a precision editor on it, multi-track audio recording. This is not a toy. You can really edit movies on this thing. It's got new themes. You can airplay your video right to Apple TV from the application. You can share your videos in HD with some really popular sites. And it's a universal app, so it will also run on the iPhone. When we start at the app, you can see our really nice new home screen with the 
old time theater, really gorgeous display here. You can see each of your projects has its own little poster. There's a thumbnail of the movie and the poster is based on the theme that's in the project. You can just scroll back and forth between these. Works great in portrait. It also works really nicely in landscape. And this looks really great on the retina display of the iPhone 4 and the iPod Touch as well. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of editing. So I'm going to scroll down here. Now I can actually use, there's a camera button on the right that I can use to, to use the camera of the iPad 2 to record directly in the timeline or I can go for my video bin. Now I can just press and hold on a clip and I can skim my finger back and forth to take a look at the video before it's been placed into the timeline or I can just tap on a clip and then I get two handles so I can actually choose the segment of the video that I want to put in. Now we have two different clips here. I'll put in a piece of that one. Select the second clip. We have another shot of that, the girl going in the water so we'll pick kind of a corresponding position there. Tap that. Drops into the timeline and we've got a cross dissolve between. If we want to do a more precise edit, for the iPad 2 we have a precision editor. So I can do a reverse pinch apart, bring up the precision editor, and now I can see all the content of the clip on the left before and after the edit and all the content for the clip on the right. I also have full control over the transition. I can double tap and we can set that to none so that'll make a cut. I can press and hold on the top dot and that allows me to choose the point within that video where we want to end. So we'll pick a spot kind of where she goes out over the water. Now I can press and hold on the lower dot and do the same thing. So we can make this kind of look like just a cut in the same shot. I can press and hold on the center dot as well and I can roll the edit. I can add and subtract frames from both sides simultaneously. When I want to take a look, we just back up a little bit and hit play. Really easy to, to keep going and adjust your edits to get things just the way that you want. And with a pinch, we close it up. GarageBand for iPad is remarkable. It's got touch instruments. You can plug in a guitar and play real instruments if you want, but it's got touch instruments that I think are going to be a huge hit with our users. Guitar amps and effects, 8-track recording and mixing, over 250 loops you can add to your songs. Uh, you can email files around of your song to anybody and it's compatible with the Mac version. So if you want to start something on your iPad and finish it on the Mac, no problem. I launched GarageBand and the first thing you see is an instrument browser. So these are all the touch instruments Steve just mentioned. And you can just swipe to tap through them and it's incredible. They turn the iPad itself into a musical instrument that you can play wherever you go. And I'll go ahead and bring up a, a keyboard to, to start showing this off. And you can see this beautiful grand piano comes up and it fills the display. And the keyboard's not just a grand piano. I can tap on that icon right in the middle there and you can see all the sounds that are built in. There are organs, electric piano, clavinet. Look at this, a whole bunch of great synthesizers that are really, really fun to play. Well, iPad has an accelerometer built in and we use that to measure the force that my finger strikes the display. So GarageBand knows if I tap something really soft or really hard. And we use that throughout the app, and that lets, lets us create these instruments that are incredibly expressive and, and fun to play. A lot of these smart instruments have this autoplay dial, and I can just go ahead and dial up a pattern. The strings fade away, now I have these big bars, so the only decision I make is which chord do I want to play. And look what happens with one touch of a finger when I tap on one of these chords. Just choose any chord. Isn't that cool? So that's just a quick look at GarageBand for iPad. It turns your iPad into a complete recording studio and a collection of these incredible touch instruments. And we just can't wait to hear all the creative things that people are going to do once they get this in their hands. Thank you. GarageBand for iPad, $4.99. It'll be on the App Store on March 11th. Editing videos and composing music on the iPad? Pretty cool. Although I guess I can't help thinking it would be a little easier if the screen was bigger. Although, be sure to come back next week when the iPad 2 goes on sale and Donald will have an in-depth review. Meanwhile, over in Switzerland, the 2011 Geneva Auto Show opened this week and Brian Cooley was on hand to peruse the new production models and concept cars. There were plenty of plug-ins and hybrids on the show floor, but not necessarily where you'd expect to find them. Check out these highlights.
Yeah, it's far from the biggest Audi, but it's got a lot of good stuff in it. This is the new Audi A3 concept being rolled out just now here at Geneva. Not that far out there. So I get excited about concepts like this because they might actually make it to showrooms more or less intact. So let's see what's going on. I'm not going to bore you with all the damn design speak about harmonious fluid lines and uh, fenders that hint at the power that lies between them, which sounds kind of obscene anyway. But there is a two and a half liter turbocharged gas direct injection engine, 408 horsepower, 368 foot pounds of torque, gets you up to 60 in about four seconds and a tiny fraction while doing 28 miles per gallon. So all of that's kind of great. But what's inside the cabin is a whole lot more interesting. Inside, there's a revised version of Audi's MMI. It includes the touchpad that is currently only found on the A8. There's an 8-inch LCD that pops up ultra-thin out of the middle of the dash. Built-in wireless broadband is envisioned to bring Google services into the car on screen or screens, as well as creating a Wi-Fi hotspot for the passengers. iPad holders in the rear of the front headrests. And check out these speakers on the rear deck. These things pop up a few millimeters when you power up the system just to say, I'm cool. This is the FF, the Ferrari FF. It stands for four passenger, four wheel drive. And they don't even have a letter for what's about to approach you right there on the rear end. That, my friends, is a hatchback. This is what they call a shooting brake, a station wagon in Euro terms. Now, this vehicle is going to slot in to replace the 612 Scalietti, which is their current high-end 2 plus 2. Biggest Ferrari engine ever in a production car, 6.3 liter V12, 651 horsepower, 504 foot-pounds of torque. Typically drives the rear wheels primarily. That's why we have this enormous transaxle back here. At times when it wants to apply power to the front for better performance, better handling, you've got this sort of two-speed Haldex gearbox underneath the front of the dry sump on this guy. That allows this car to do a torque vectoring method. When it detects slip, this stuff kicks in and applies power to the front. If it doesn't, it remains a rear-wheel drive car in the sporting tradition. Ah, this is rather a nice place to do business, wouldn't you say? We've got an actual mechanical or analog tack Notice on the right side, I've got a split screen of two cameras. Here's our Ferrari head unit. This can be a 1200 watt system with gobs of surround sound speakers. I don't need to convince you that it sounds good. Oh, did you see in the back? Fitted luggage is available as well, including two full sets of golf clubs and some nice looking valises. Now, pricing and availability is not yet set on the FF, although I see some potential customers milling around. Uh, that looks like Nick Mason from Pink Floyd over there. So they'll get the regulars in first. These may not be in ready supply for quite a while. Well, you know, when you see the spirit of ecstasy illuminated in electric blue, something's happening at Rolls-Royce. The something is the electrification of the Phantom. This is an experimental Phantom, the 102 EX, an experimental platform to make one of these guys all battery powered. The engine came out, that was the 6.7 liter V12, and in goes 96 batteries of a very uh, sort of complex chemistry, nickel, cobalt, manganese. I've not actually heard of that before. That gives you 270 kilowatts of power, that's about 360 horsepower, but 590 potential foot-pounds of torque. Zero to 60 could happen in about eight seconds. That's slower by over two seconds than a gas engine Phantom, but still not a slouch. The power goes out down to the back where the electric motors live, and they split it up to the rear wheels only via a differential, almost a quaint traditional setup. Range on this guy about 120 miles, they say, they hope, they will figure out, because this is a test bed for use throughout the year ahead. Oh, by the way, charging time on this, despite the massive number of batteries in here, they say would be industry standard, about eight hours for a full charge on a 223 phase circuit. Now, inside, <sighs> If I had a bourbon, I'd get my mail forwarded here. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Inside, we've got some more indications. This is a very different vehicle. Here is a charge state indicator echoing the lights that are over there at the charging port. Oh, by the way, if this little uh, smuggler's bin of key little tech switches is not enough for you, you'll love this one. There's the traditional analog clock. There's the very non-traditional LCD display. And that is, by the way, specific to the electric version of this car. Torquey, emissions-free, avant-garde technology, all of that's great, but what really intrigues me is that these cars are already as quiet as the day after you died, and that's with a V12 barn burner up in front. 
Imagine what it would be like with a virtually silent electric powertrain. You just want to curl up and take a nap. These are not for sale. Like I mentioned, this is a one-off electric prototype, but they're going to be testing it and testing it hard through 2011. Who knows? There may be a real one one day soon. Look, if you didn't have one of these yourself, you know somebody who did. The VW Rabbit Slash Golf Cabrio. This thing sold like mad from 79 to 2002. Then it got bumped off the stage by its two drop-top siblings, the new Beetle convertible and the EOS drop-top. But now it's back, although not yet for the US. This guy's gonna offer a choice of six power plants in Europe. One of them is a 1.6 liter turbo diesel that delivers 53 miles per gallon and no hybridicity involved. The top is interesting. It's a rag top in the true sense, not a retractable. That keeps the price down. But as you can see, when it's down, it almost violates the definition of a cabriolet, which normally infers a convertible that leaves its top apparatus kind of untidily piled back here. But this is almost flush with the belt line. Oh, now the big question, when this is down, what happens to the trunk? We've seen some cars lately at CNET CarTech that are a joke when the top is down. Let's find out. Tilt the logo handle. Not bad, look at that. It's almost like magic. And then yes, there is a lowered ceiling on the trunk all the time, but that makes room for the top to go down and not change your volume back here, which is kind of good. I'd rather have a little less room all the time than nasty surprises when the top's down some of the time. Now again, this car is not slotted for US distribution just yet. I'm not gonna quote prices in Europe because it doesn't equate that way on a simple currency conversion. But we'll see if they can bring this to the US or maybe send the EOS pack. Well, if the Golf does make it to the U.S., a whole new generation of high school girls can look forward to some sweet gifts for their 16th birthdays. All right, the time has come for us to take a break, but we will be right back with more Tech Review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good... It's time to go to the movies. Or more accurately, it's time to go behind the scenes of the movies. Daniel Turdeman got a chance to talk to some of the folks behind ILM's new animated feature, Rango, starring Johnny Depp. Or starring his voice, anyway. You ain't from around here, are you? Uh, I'm, I'm still working on it. Uh... So, what's your name? Baines. That's a funny kind of name. Hi, I'm Daniel Turdeman from CNET News, and this is Rango from director Gore Verbinski. It's also the first animated feature that Industrial Light and Magic has worked on after more than 30 years of live-action movies. Last week, we got a chance to visit ILM and talk to a visual effects supervisor and one of the lead animators on the movie about what it's like to treat an animated feature like a live-action movie. Well, early on, we, we realized that we didn't know how to make an animated feature, so we actually reached out to the community and, and had people come in and, and talk to us um, and tell us about how to make an animated feature. And, and really early on, I realized that we were actually breaking a lot of, a lot of the rules of, of how animated features are, are being made and that we weren't actually making your standard animated feature. So in the end, it actually really came to be that we were kind of making a live action movie. So a lot of what our backgrounds were coming from a live action background um, really helped out and really actually became a, a benefit and a strength um, for us rather than being uh, maybe a detriment as some people thought it might be. So we had really great artwork, uh, two-dimensional artwork from, uh, from Crash, he's the production designer, um, for each character. But the problem with that is that um, you don't know what the character looks like from all angles. So we would make in the computer what we call a maquette, which allows us to actually look at the character from all different angles so that we could check the proportions and, and check to see you know, how they're going to look from the back or from the side. So um, our modelers would spend about three days making this maquette. And this was kind of a new process for us at ILM. We hadn't really done this before, but we found out that it actually really um, actually made the process faster for us because we could get a buy off on the proportions of what the character is going to look like before we did all the really hard work of adding hair and dirt and grime and things like that. He wanted this film to be gritty and dirty and sweaty. He wanted you to be able to smell the breath of the characters. So we looked at, we looked at life um, as, we, as we always do at ILM and uh, for some clues. You know, so this gave us some interesting textures and markings, and you know it seemed like that is that is Rango's eye. 
And the eyes are wild. You know, these they can flick in different directions, and um, they can even cave in, which we didn't go nearly that crazy with them. On the anime feature versus a live action film, um, we were we were way more involved. It was a really, really rewarding and artistic process. It was great. Help! Help! Open the door! It was like a little theater troupe full of talented actors uh, running around acting like cartoons. And it was definitely a joy to watch and extremely informative for, for animation. As long as that sign says Sheriff, you can believe that there's law and order in this town. They shot the movie like they were making a like they were making a movie. No, no different except um, less locations and, uh, and uh, the props weren't quite as fancy. Neighbor turns on neighbor? Pretty soon we're eating our children. Dogs and cats are getting together to create all sorts of unnatural mutant aberrations. I am totally going to see that movie. And I might even take my kid. All right, enough frivolity. It's time to get serious and check out the bad. Whether it's playing games on your laptop or watching movies on your big screen, having to settle for crummy audio can really put a damper on your experience. All the more reason to steer clear of these two speaker options. Hey, I'm Justin New, associate editor at CNET with a review of the Razer Ferrix gaming speakers. For 60 bucks, these USB rechargeable speakers are marketed as gaming specific, but there's really nothing about them that specifically benefits gaming audio. That said, their audio quality is more on par with USB speakers, and you can get much more features and better amplification out of the Creative D100 Bluetooth boombox. That one's reviewed on CNET as well. It's $20 more, but you'll be more satisfied with the sound quality. Now, the hardware consists of these two satellite speakers joined by a nylon cable that features a USB charging plug on one side and a 3.5 millimeter audio jack on the other. If you push the top of each dome, the speakers expand to reveal a mesh chamber where the sound comes out. So you can use the jack to play music out of any device with a standard headphone port like an iPhone or iPad. But the D100 by Creative has a more elegant wireless Bluetooth solution so you don't have to carry around this clumsy cord with you. And Razer makes the claim that the chambers actually strengthen the bass and resonance of your music, but we tested the volume levels and are disappointed with the audio fidelity. We played several songs across a variety of genres through the Ferrix speakers, and we noticed lots of bass and treble distortions even at low volumes. Like we said before, your dollar will go much further with a slightly more expensive audio solution like the Creative Bluetooth D100 speakers, so you should definitely check those out if you're in the market. You can read all the details in our full review on CNET, but that's going to do it for me. I'm Justin Yu. These are the Razer Ferrix mobile gaming speakers, and that sounds good to me. Hi, I'm Matthew Muscoviak from CNET.com, and we're going to take a look at the Ankyo HTX 22 HDX. This is a 2.1 home theater system, and it's currently selling online for about $250. Now, Ankyo is known for having big, boxy speakers, but this is really more of a lifestyle system. There are just two small speakers and the subwoofer, which also has an AV receiver built in. The subwoofer has a glossy front panel with an LCD display, and there are also a few controls on the top, such as volume control and input selection for when the remote goes missing. Now, around back, you'll see all the inputs. The most important are the three HDMI inputs, which will cover most of your home theater gadgets, and there are also three digital audio inputs and two analog inputs for all your extra AV devices. You also notice that there are extra speaker jacks on the back, and you can buy an additional speaker package from Ankyo to upgrade the system to a full 5.1 home theater system. Now the big missing feature for us is an easy way to connect an iPod. We would have liked either a front panel mini jack input, or even better, a built-in iPod dock, which we've seen on a lot of other systems. Now for a home theater system, sound quality is the most important feature, and here the Ankyo was a little disappointing. When we listen to, say, action scenes in movies, the Ankyo just didn't sound powerful enough to fill up our medium-sized testing room. Music didn't fare much better either, and we could really hear the limitations of the smaller speakers included with the system. So in all, the Ankyo HTX 22 HDX is a nice-looking system and has a strong feature set for the price, but its sound quality really didn't impress us, and it's much better suited to smaller rooms. I'm Matthew Muscoviak, and this is the Ankyo HTX 22 HDX. Tough week for the audio guys in New York, I guess. Hopefully something better will come across their desk soon. All right, let's go ahead and check out this week's bottom line. 
So back to the iPad 2. Yes, it's faster, it's more powerful, it comes in black and white and so on and so on. But the real question on everyone's mind was, what about that mind-blowing case? Seriously, you missed it the first time? Here you go. One of my favorite little videos, it actually kind of reminds me of a Pixar short or something like that. <laughs> um, but as you see, we actually built magnets right into the iPad itself. And then there's magnets in the hinge for the smart cover. And it not only holds the cover on, but it auto aligns it. It's really cool. And of course, what would these cases be if they didn't come in colors? So we've got five polyurethane colors and five colors of uh, leather. And they're really, really beautiful. They look great with the black unit. They look great with the white unit. The polyurethane cases are $39. The leather cases are $69. And uh, we think this is going to, we think people are going to love these cases. The bottom line this week, doesn't anyone at Apple have kids? The smart cover is pretty slick, but how's it supposed to help if your four-year-old drops your new iPad 2 while he's watching the Cars movie for the 353rd time? Hypothetically. Also, I can't wait until we start hearing reports about bus passes and credit cards getting all messed up because of the magnets. My suggestion, keep it out of your purse. All right, that's our show for this time, everyone, but we'll be back next week with a brand new CNET Tech Review. And until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.